I'm Dave Gray, and this is The Service Design Show. In The Service Design Show, we talk to people that are shaping the service design field. In this episode, I'm talking to Dave Gray. Dave is the co-founder of Xplain and the writer of the popular book called GameStorming. We're going to talk about customer centricity, internal culture, habits and norms, and how it all relates. And at the end of the show, Dave is going to talk a bit about his upcoming book called Liminal Thinking. So if you're interested in that, be sure to stick around till the end. Welcome to the show, Dave. Thanks. Great to be here, Mark. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, you're actually, like I uh, already uh, told you, the first one uh, outside of Europe to be on the show. How does it feel? Pretty exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, pretty exciting. Uh, not many people choose St. Louis for their first uh, uh, connection to the U.S., so that's great. Well, uh, Dave, I'm not sure if this one, uh, this question actually applies to you, but uh, so far I have... I've had people that are actually really in the service design field. And I uh, asked everyone, do you recall your very first memory of service design? Does it apply to you? Do you recall your very first memory of service design? Yeah, actually, I was in, uh, I was visiting London, in fact, and uh, on Twitter, uh, somehow connected with a guy named Ben Reason, who uh, runs a... Uh, uh, company called Live Work, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> met up with Ben for a coffee, and I asked him what he did, and he told me service design, mm -hmm. and I said, "What's that?" <laughs> and and what did he tell me, you? <laughs> uh, whoa, you know, you're you're asking me to go way back, but I, I think he told me something along the line of, uh, "It's the design of services." Right. And, and uh, uh, so I, I've I've read a number of I've you know I, I'm a I'm a founding member of the chapter of the Service Design Network in St. Louis okay. here. And we've had a lot of these, uh, we've had this sort of conversation on the board about defining service design. And I've always been the one advocating for why are we making this complicated? Because what's wrong with saying it's the design of services? Right. Uh, but I, I'm, apparently that's not, um, that's not, exp that's not clear enough. <laughs> Well, I, for some people. I, I've been in the service design field for 10 years and I've let go of trying to define service design. So, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I wish you luck and uh, l let me know if you are, if you are found consensus on the definition. Um, uh, Dave, you're part of the uh, service design show and uh, we have a co-creation format on the questions we're going to talk about. Um, let's explain the format just very briefly for the people who've never seen an episode before. I've um, I've got three topics over here um, that we can talk about, and you also have some question starters, not on paper, but in a more digital way, right? Can you show one? Sure, I got my uh, my uh, wow. iPad here, and those pictures that you sent me. Yeah. Oops. So, uh, for instance, you've got a what if, and I've got internal workings, and um, it, it will be up to you to uh, come up, how can we to come up with an uh, interesting question that you're going to answer yourself uh, on this topic. <laughs> Sounds easy, right? Okay. No. <laughs> we'll see how we'll <laughs> see how it goes. Um, let me just uh, let, let's just let you start, and we'll see uh, where we end. Um, <clears throat> the fir very first topic um, I'm interested in is this one that you. Um, provided me customer centric organizations what question starter goes along with this topic well uh, I guess I'd say how might we create more customer centric organizations and can you el elaborate on that uh, sure I think well I think this is a challenge that a lot of organizations are having today they are uh, uh, many organizations that have been around for, let's say, 100 years or more have uh, organized themselves around internal efficiency. So they were the phone company or they were the bank or they were the, um, you know, taxi company or the hotel company. And their primary purpose was to, um, within the hotel industry, to do a great job and be become efficient and so forth. And every company had a strategy. Uh, but... Uh, 
the over many years, those organizations have, many of them have become focused on internal efficiency and operations and lowering costs in order to increase profits, which sometimes takes them away from really understanding customers. And mm -hmm. what's happened, mm -hmm. as I'm sure men, you and, and I and many of your viewers are aware, is that uh, technology has shifted the landscape so significantly that, uh, P and, and those companies in their quest for internal efficiency have pissed off enough customers <laughs> or alienated enough customers that there's a huge set of opportunities yeah. now for organizations to um, spin up relatively rapidly a brand new value proposition that uh, 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 disintermediates or uh, really disrupts those existing business models. Mm -hmm. For example, you're in the hotel business, um, Airbnb comes along, uh, serving a totally, uh, taking your customers away and giving them a very viable option that doesn't use hotels at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've used Airbnb in, uh, I haven't used it in Utrecht, but I've used it in Amsterdam. I've rented a houseboat. It was great. Yeah. And, and, and that's all money that would have gone to a hotel. Uh, so uh, what organizations, uh, you know, are trying to do now is to become more customer centric, become more oriented towards customers so they can get, do better at, um, uh, figuring out what those customers need and maybe avoid being disrupted quite so easily. Right. So, uh, and I hope that all the viewers and listeners of the show agree that, uh, becoming more customer centric is the, the only way to survive, uh, in the coming uh, decade. But, uh, what do you see as one of the biggest challenges in this? Because I, th yeah, again, we all agree. What what is the biggest struggle for organizations? What, one of well, them. Ben, uh, yeah, Ben Reason told me, in fact, when we when we did talk um, about this, and he said, uh, "Well, I believe it was Ben who said to me, it's easy to design a customer a service that customers will love. Uh, it's easy to you know." To, draw it out on a service blueprint or draw a map of it. What's difficult, what's really hard is getting the organization to adapt in order to deliver mm -hmm. that service consistently. Mm -hmm. So whenever you uh, whenever you design a service, uh, if the company, you can just, you can design a new service and start a new company, in which case you have a challenge, still a, a service delivery challenge. You've got to still be able to deliver that. But if you're, it, if you're, actually creating a new service experience for an existing company, it's even more difficult because you've got a company and, and entrenched embedded habits that might be, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, that are, that are just kind of worn into the organization. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, just like any habit, they are hard to break. Yeah. So we'll get into habits, uh, in a, in a second, but I'm also interested in, uh, when you think about customer centricity and, uh, customer experience, what is the biggest question you have around that topic? Around which topic? Well, how, how co uh, companies become more customer centric? Well, I'm very fascinated by the internal um, uh, organizational challenges. Uh, you have um, you have companies. I've seen companies where everybody knows the right thing to do, and yet nobody yeah. does it. So yeah. why is that? Yeah. Uh, you know, why is it so hard to change organizational habits and behaviors? Um, why are the, uh, uh, what makes it so difficult? I'm fascinated by culture. I think organizational culture is something that we could have a lot of, uh, probably a very long discussion on even what it is or how mm -hmm. to define it. Mm -hmm. But um, I think culture is widely recognized as one of the, um, one of the major drivers of success, but also one of the major barriers to change because it is culture um, is uh, like habits and, you know, kind of habitual behaviors is, uh, it, it creates momentum in a positive way. If you've got the, if you've got certain behaviors that you don't think about, but you do and they're successful behaviors, it's great. Mm -hmm. But sometimes those behaviors that have been successful in the past are no longer successful because the business environment has changed. And so the company has to figure out, <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me, how to change its habits. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I, I'm thinking about um, um, uh, culture, habits, and uh, norms. It's actually uh, uh, laying here in front of me. Um, 
Well, I would say you could say even like, I mean, uh, one very valid definition of culture is that culture is the habits of the yeah. organization. Yeah. So um, let's just move on uh, to to that topic that that we have got here. And um, the only thing you need to do is uh, to pick a question starter that goes along with this one. We already tapped into it. Well, let's see here. Let's make an interesting one. A challenging one. Wow. So it's about culture, <laughs> norms, habits, and behaviors. Uh, yeah, I don't. None of these are really fitting very easily for me. Uh, yeah. um, you, well, why? Why do I say that uh, culture is? I can't read your your yeah, picture yeah, there. Yeah. Why? Why do I say that culture is norms, habits, and behaviors? How's that? And what would be your answer? Uh, well, I think uh, you could say culture is whatever you want it to say. Uh, culture, what I've noticed is that uh, when major initiatives fail, often culture is the uh, easy target to blame. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that people can blame culture uh, when there's a failure is because nobody actually really knows what it means. Mm -hmm. So you can say, well, we failed because of the culture. And sure. yeah. Because culture is not something that most companies measure. There usually are not people in the company whose job it is to focus on the culture. Uh, blaming the culture is in a way like blaming nobody or also a way like blaming everybody. Exactly, yeah. Um, and saying, well, you know, we couldn't do it because the culture wouldn't support it. Uh, I've heard people talk about the culture as if it's the immune system of the company, as if it's uh, antibodies or antigens or, um, you know, that the culture, the company rejected this initiative just like a patient rejecting an artificial heart. It just kind of, uh, you know, popped out. It didn't work. And, uh, and what, uh, what is your response to that? Uh, well, I think the question is, if that's the case, then we need to get better at defining it and we need to get better at understanding what it is and how to shift it. Mm. Um, I got sick of hearing it, honestly, and that's yeah. why I developed this tool that, uh, uh, with uh, Alex Osterwalder called the Culture Map is I felt that organizations needed a better way, better tools, uh, better practices, better understanding of what is culture, what does it mean, uh, how does it come to be and how does it come to be changed how does it come to how, how does it evolve and how can we become more intentional about the uh the culture in the organization what if you had a chief culture officer what would that person's job be what would be measured uh, how would you measure the success of that job how would you what are the kpis of the chief culture so, so officer what are your latest insight on that because i think this is really essential yeah, I think, well, I think, here's the thing. I, I think there are there are um, uh, organizations out there that will purport to measure your culture for you, and many of them do it through surveys. Um, they will uh, they will have a kind of a, a wheel or a diagram, and they will orient, they will, they will say, tell you where you are, kind of like a clock where you are in the, or a compass yeah. where you are in this diagram. Are you a competitive organization? Are you creative? Are you collaborative? Are you more control oriented. Um, and I think those uh, kinds of assessments can be helpful, but they are so high level that they do not get into, I mean, really, in some ways, they're saying there are only four kinds of organizations, mm -hmm. which is a, I see as a great oversimplification. It's like saying um, that there's only four kinds of cultures. I mean, can you imagine in, you live in Europe? Yeah. You think there's only four kinds of cultures in Europe? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have you, you traveled around that much? I mean, you go to Spain, you go to Finland, uh, you go to uh, you go to Sweden, you go to Switzerland. I think there's more than four. I think, and I think what makes uh, just what just like what makes a, a country unique, or what makes a family unique, or what uh, is also what makes organizations unique. Um, culture can be a fantastically valuable strategic asset for a company. If you understand it, if you understand what you have, and if you understand the strengths and weaknesses, because every culture inherently will have strengths, but also will have uh, vulnerabilities as well and weaknesses. So uh, you mentioned something about uh, the, the a culture map. Is that the tool? Yes. I'm, I'm actually not familiar with it. Could you elaborate a bit on that? 
Oh, wow. I, um, yes, uh, I don't have a printout of it in front of me, uh, I, but uh, I can share it with you after and you can link yeah, to well, it. We'll definitely uh, uh, send a link, yeah. So if you're familiar with Alex Osterwalder and, and the business model canvas, uh, the value proposition canvas, he's designed a few of these and he's a friend of mine and an advocate for business tools for strategic thinking. Mm -hmm. So the service blueprint, which many of your viewers will probably be familiar with is an example of, or a customer journey map is an example of a tool for strategic thinking. Uh, the culture map is a, specifically a tool for strategic thinking about culture. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it's very simple, uh, three boxes, uh, but they are, um, the purpose of it is to help any uh, group or organization start to get a better understanding of what are the, um, what are the habits of the company, um, what are the outcomes that are being delivered because of those habits, and what are the enablers and blockers that uh, help or hurt those habits from coming into being. It's also a design tool for helping to think about, well, if we want to get some different kinds of outcomes, what kind of behaviors would we need to be thinking about? And then how might we uh, build management and infrastructure and support to enable certain behaviors and block other behaviors? It, it really reminds me of uh, a tool that we've used uh, in, in several projects where we actually make a a persona or a real life person out of the organization. So if your company would be your neighbor, how would mm. he behave? Who would he be? What kind of clothes would he wear? Uh, um, and uh, I, I see that a lot of organizations are struggling to actually define something like that. It's really hard to... to well, but even if you can define it, that's the easy part, right? <laughs> because then you say if your company, let's say, well, our company is a really friendly neighbor, our company is gen a generous neighbor. Yeah. Uh, you can borrow his uh, or her lawnmower anytime you want. If you need a cup of sugar, you can go and get that. Yeah. And then to, to, to turn the organization into that uh, neighbor, that's yeah. the difficult part. Yeah. It's it. You can and just like a service design, you can you can imagine a, a beautiful uh, universe, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that you can make it happen. The making it happen part is the hard part, and that's the part that fascinates me. How do you actually, you know, once you envision that wonderful neighbor, how do you actually turn your neighbor into that person? Well, yeah, and and <laughs> on a personal level, we know that if we want to exercise more and eat healthier or uh, quit smoking, we know what. Uh, procedures we can follow to, to change our habits. Are, have you encountered similar things for organizations that want to change their habits, their norms, their culture? Oh yeah, I'd say it's about the same. Uh, just imagine 5,000 people trying to quit smoking all at the same time. And that will give you a good sense of the challenge of culture change. Yeah, and I, and I think the challenge is clear. and. Uh, what fascinates me is where where can we find clues towards uh, the answers on how to make that the shift actually happen? Where where can we look? Well, the culture map is a, is a is a design to help you think about those things. But the middle layer, so imagine three stripes like a flag. Um, do you have uh, the middle layer is behavior? So the behaviors are all the things that we do, the yeah. habits. The, the things that people do in the organization. Uh, the top layer are the outcomes. Those are the things that we get. You know, we, we behave a certain way, we see this kind of profit, we see this kind of outcome. We move, maybe we, one of the outcomes we see is that we move slower than we'd like, mm -hmm. or that we are not as customer oriented as we would like. We, are, we're fo we get internal efficiency, but we don't get customer satisfaction. We, these are the outcomes. Yeah. And then below the layer below behavior is called the enablers and the blockers. These are the things that uh, management and an organization can control. They are things like the physical layout of the office space, uh, the way that uh, the way that people are recruited and hired, uh, the kinds of people that are recruited and hired, the way that the incentives are set up, the yeah, way that yeah. the organization is structured, the way that the org chart is uh, designed, um, the way that we are organized to deliver these services, the informal rules, the, uh, the, uh, the things that are unwritten rules, they, they're th that are, but they, the, the things that people do, even though they're not in the, uh, in the policy manual, they do them 
because it's the easiest way to get things done or the most expedient way or because they've just because they've been doing it that way for years and years and it's the way that they know. Yep. So those are the those are the areas that management um, often has a high degree and even the workers um, have a high degree of control over. And those are the things that will help to shift culture. For example, if you're trying to quit smoking, what are the things you could do? Well, you can make sure you have plenty of snacks uh, handy. You can make sure that you don't hang out with your friends who smoke. You can make sure that you don't uh, go to places where people smoke. You can get yourself a Nintendo, which is what I did when I quit smoking. Get yourself a get yourself a video game controller so your hands are always uh, busy when you're sitting in your favorite chair. Um, you can. There are a lot of things you can do to support uh, uh, habits and behavior change. Um, this is one of them. Uh, I mean, uh, when an organization is trying to change its habits, I recommend that they only focus on one at a time. You you may you may find that there are fifteen or 20 different habits that you are going to need to change as an organization. Well, which one do you do focus on first? If you're going to just do one at a time, that's another thing that the culture map is very helpful in because it helps you see the connections between outcomes, behaviors, and blockers and enablers. So you can find those uh, keystone enablers or those keystone blockers that are the very uh, core uh, things that you want to move first because they're going to have the maximum impact. I can give you examples. I mean, yeah. there's a company um, I was working with where it became very, they were trying to become more collaborative, uh, more, um, uh, it was again, more, more customer oriented, but very much more collaborative, trying to break down the organizational silos, the, the different, the disconnects between the different divisions. And one thing that kept coming up in the, in our uh, culture mapping over and over was, well, uh, we have a culture where I'm, feel chained to my desk. Mm. I don't feel free to get up and move around. Uh, we heard things like, uh, well, I don't feel like I can walk by the management team because they feel like I'm not working. Or if my boss comes by my desk and I'm not there, um, I feel a lot of pressure to be there. Um, we, we know that the senior exec team has told us that we can work from home, but I don't feel that I'm free from to work from yeah. home. Yeah. And I've, I've had I have this uh, person who's just down the hall and I've had over the course of a week, 20 or 30 emails with this person. And I could have just got, walked down the hall and had a conver 10 minute conversation yeah, and we could have yeah. solved the whole yeah. thing, but we didn't do it because I don't, I feel chained to my desk. So that was the first habit that we decided with that organization. Okay. What's the habit we want to change first? Do you feel free to move around? Do you feel chained to your desk? And, and uh, can you get a, give an example of what kind of in, uh, intervention you actually did? did? Did you have the opportunity to actually change something? Yeah, well, in this case, it was a matter of the senior executive team uh, stating it and focusing on it for a period of time and also measuring it. So, yeah. uh, you know, this is maybe a trait of many organizations, but something that the executive team makes a commitment to and something that they're measuring is some, and that's a priority and yeah. something people pay attention yeah. to, yeah. which is, this is the reason why I recommend that a company focus on one thing at a time. So what happened in that case, um, the executive team said, we're going to focus on this habit until we've made progress on it and we're going to measure it. Right. And every uh, week at the end of the week, you're going to get an email. It's going to be anonymous. We just want you to tell us on a scale of zero to five, do you feel free to wander around or do you feel chained to your desk? Zero means chained to your desk. Five means free to walk around. And we're going to keep doing this until we see that we're consistently, you know, up around for we're moving forward. And uh, once we feel like we've actually achieved that habit, then we'll we'll work on the next one. And so every week on Friday, people would get that uh, question. And the every Monday, the executive team would be looking at it and saying, well, why is this so low? And they would look at the comments <laughs> and uh, they would start to work on that stuff. And so I think it's just a matter of just like any kind of habit, focus, focused attention, um, continue to focus on it, dedicate it. Yeah, I mean, basically making it a priority is yeah. what makes a, a new habit take hold. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that's maybe one of the hardest things for organizations to actually realize that this is a long-term investment. Um, 
and it doesn't yeah. provide results on it might not provide results on a short term notice I think that's the hard part I think most I think people do realize it I, I mm. don't think that's the hard part I think people mm. realize that it's a long-term investment they realize that it's hard uh, but it's just it's the same thing as your New Year's resolution it's yeah. The, yeah. the hard part is not realizing that you in order to lose weight you have to eat less the yeah. hard part is eating less it is actually those making those tough decisions every day and those trade-offs I think it's it is it is hard work I don't think that it culture initiatives fail because people don't realize it's hard work I think culture initiatives fail because people just don't do the hard work <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they, they've, we've got one. Uh, I've got one last topic here, and I th we've touched upon it in the last twenty minutes uh, all the time. But maybe we can uh, add something to it. And this is um, about the internal workings. Um, mm. Can we add something to the to the conversations we've already been having? Sure. So. I think you mentioned something about how do we apply service design to the internal workings of our organizations. That was one of your. Yeah, well, how can we yeah. uh, shift the internal workings when we have a when we have a service design or a new idea and we know that it's going to be a challenge? How can we shift the internal workings of the organization? How can we how can we go into that? clock and all those gears and that are designed to make us turn left and suddenly how can we translate that so we're now turning right instead of left um, what can we do with those internal work clockworks um, and i say clockworks because a lot of organizations are designed in a way like a clock they're they are designed as step one, then handoff, then step two, then handoff, then step three, and then you've got it. Now you've got the ball. We're going to hand it over to you. Um, I think that uh, the it goes back to customer centricity. So if you've started and you've done some great service design work and you have uh, an idea of a, um, a service that you want to deliver uh, to customers, I think you know it's almost like you want to you might want to pilot it and then initially um, try and deliver that service in one location mm -hmm. um, with one team and maybe even um, uh, where you as a service designer are actually doing the work yourself to figure out how this stuff happens and if there's software that needs to be designed maybe you've got a paper prototype or something mm -hmm. that allows you to um, really understand those workings and what people have to do and if you're forming if you're finding that you know if you could create a situation where either you or a team is actually kind of running the interference in other words you know doing it by hand in a way uh, to figure out what needs to be done and like do it in a in a relatively controlled in a relatively small way and actually figure out what all the problems are and expect it to break and let it break and let things go wrong and actually start having conversations with people and actually look at the internal challenges as another whole other service design project because everyone internally um, provide is can be seen as someone or a team who provides a service to another exactly. team. Yeah. So yeah. if you just continue, you, you know, you're not done with your service design project when you've designed the service for the customer. You've got probably hundreds of customers and hundreds of services that need to be designed in order to support that service being delivered. So that's, I think, uh, you know, just like think about service design as something that needs to permeate throughout the organization, not just on, it might start with the customer, but you've got to work your way in. Yeah, and it seems to be a recurring pattern in the talks, uh, in the episodes uh, so far that uh, organizations that actually want to become customer centric uh, m might have to focus first on their internal customer instead of the external. You know that. Uh, well, it's kind of a kind of. I think you. I think it's both. I think you got to work from the outside in, and I think you also got to work from the inside out. And if you're lucky. You know the the uh, it's like the railroad tracks in the old west where they they met and they had the golden spike and they yeah. nailed down the golden spike in the middle in Ogden, Utah. You know if you're lucky they made in the middle in exactly the right spot. Uh, I mean I think that's the challenge. Um, you know I've I've seen companies where um, they've done great work on the customer side, but there actually are 
20 different kinds of customers and they're the the work maybe on the customer side is perhaps too high level for the internal teams to be able to connect so those that those connections i think you need to do, do both i think you need to work mm -hmm. from the outside in and from the inside out and find and there are probably almost always some compromises uh one side or another and you want some um uh, to make those trade-offs in an intelligent, strategic way. <clears throat> We're, we are heading towards uh, a wrap-up of our conversation, so I'm really curious uh, when people approach you and say, uh, Dave, I want to get into service design. Uh, I don't know how often that happens, but uh, let's say they do. What is your tip for them, for people that want to start with service design? Well, uh, I mentioned that we started up the Service Design Network chapter uh, here in St. Louis, and uh, that would be one of my first recommendations: is join the Service Design Network. Find peers, uh, find the other people who are doing service design. You can learn from them. Uh, there's a there's a wonderful community that's uh, emerged over the past few years that is focused on this. Um, there are tons of people practicing it. There, it's an organizational imperative in many organizations to figure this out. Uh, not just customer centricity, but uh, digital transformation. There's a lot of physical services that have been done in uh, manual ways that are needing to move to digital delivery, um, needing to uh, be enabled by mobile devices. There are a ton of really fascinating and interesting uh, problems that need to be solved. Um, yeah, so I'd say first step would be uh, find those peers, find those people who are doing it and start learning from them. And we have uh, here in St. Louis and probably anywhere else where there's a service design chapter, there will be events where you'll have people coming in. Our next one is uh, on citizen-focused service design. So we've got people coming in to uh, actually talk about government and design for citizens. How do you design government services for uh, uh, with citizens in mind? So there's, a, there's just so much uh, um, exciting uh, stuff going on, I think. And that's for me, that's the first stop. Join the community. Become the community. Yeah, join the community. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. And then talking Absolutely. about uh, service design events, there's one coming up in Amsterdam later this year. I, well, oh, great. Yeah, it's it's going to be the Global Service Design Conference, actually. Okay, wow. wow. Uh, uh, we might see you there. <laughs> it's in Amsterdam. <laughs> well, I, I always love a good excuse to come to Amsterdam, so. Well, uh, well be sure to, uh, to let us know. Uh, your, your, this is your chance, Dave. Is there a question that you would like to ask the viewers? Uh, sure. I, I guess uh, one question would be, um, how can I help you? Mm -hmm. How can I help you do your work? What can I do to uh, uh, help you get better at your work? Okay. And uh, before we uh, totally wrap up, we haven't touched upon it, upon it explicitly, but you have a new book coming up, right? I do. Can we talk two minutes about the book? What is it about? Uh, sure, and, I'd be uh, delighted. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, the book is called Liminal Thinking, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean a lot to people who are not familiar with the word liminal. But uh, where it comes from is this uh, this internal change problem. And, you know, I've done a lot of design thinking work, uh, co-creation, use drawing, making maps, working with sticky notes, etc. And I've noticed that one of the things that the design thinking type of work is not good at is helping people change their thinking, helping people become more self-aware, uh, become better at listening to themselves and their emotions, excuse me, become better at uh, changing their own mindsets and behaviors. And, and what I mean by that is I've seen many initiatives where we were, it felt like we were doing everything right. And the senior team was uh, running around asking people to change their behavior, mm. and the senior team wasn't changing their own behavior mm. in a way that was setting a, the right example, and yet they believed that they were. They, they thought that they were changing their behavior, but they were not. So um, what's going on there, and how do you actually get to inside of people, get them uh, actually doing more of that introspective, reflective kind of work about, okay, who am I? How are people perceiving me? Uh, how am I contributing to the problems that I'm seeing and trying and and 
are there better and different ways for me to try to solve those people issue, those behavior, those human social relationship oriented issues we call sometimes politics, uh, all those social and re relational type issues that uh, cause problems in organizations, but can also make them really wonderful. Uh, liminal thinking is a book to help people figure that out. Uh, one of the questions that I have heard a lot from people is, well, um, I see that my organization needs to change, but I'm not the CEO. I'm in the middle somewhere. What yeah, can I do? Yeah. I, I'm on the yeah. front line or I'm in the middle. I'm a middle yeah. manager. And uh, Liminal Thinking is a, a book that answers that question. I, I, and it took me a whole book to answer the question, so I can't give the, sh the, the brief <laughs> version. But the, 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 the brief version is there's a lot you can do. There's a ton that you can do. Uh, none of it is – you can't. there's nothing you can do without taking some personal risk. But uh, if you're willing to uh, think about it, be thoughtful about it, be reflective and take – some small personal risks, uh, you be you you will amaze yourself at what you can do. And how did um, how did writing the book change yourself? Oh well, I mean, it, uh, I've learned a lot. I started out writing a totally different book than I ended up writing. I, I learned a ton. Uh, it's changed my okay. So uh, just to, to give you some results, um, uh, my relationships at work are better. Um, I've been told that I, you know, I'm coming, showing up to work in a much better way. Uh, I am, um, uh, I'm less uh, attached to specific outcomes. I'm more focused on the stuff that's appropriate for me to be focused on. I don't get dragged into the weeds as easily. Uh, my office is clean and well organized, much more well organized than it has been in the past. My personal relationships are, are much better. My relationship with my wife has improved. Um, my mind feels fresh and clear every morning. I mean, really, it's, it's, it's been tremendous. There's been a tremendous amount of, um, of change. And that's not just because of writing the book, because, but because of the learning. And uh, the book's full of exercises, too. And it's actually you know doing those exercises, sharing the book with my wife, doing some of the exercises and experiments together um it's really been uh, it's really been a fascinating journey i have to say um <clears throat> can you give a, a rough estimate when the book should be available it should be coming out this summer we're we're just working on the cover designs now the internal uh layout is complete the uh the uh, copy is editing is pretty much done <laughs> Um, it's looking good. I think we're just trying to get that final uh, cover layout designed and it, it should be out by the end of the summer. Well, I, I think once the book is out, we'll do a giveaway uh, f f for the most uh, interesting comment on, uh, on this episode. Excellent. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> Dave, we've run out of time, so I want to thank you for being the first outside of Europe. Uh, to joining uh, the show uh, and thanks for giving us insights in, in your uh, challenges, thoughts, ideas. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. What are your thoughts about the topics we've just discussed with Dave? How does culture influence customer centricity? Let us know down below in the comments. If you enjoyed this episode and like to see more interviews with service design pioneers, subscribe to the channel and be sure to check out some of the past episodes. With the Service Design Show, we help you to stay one step ahead by talking to the people that are actually shaping the service design field. Thanks for watching and see you next time.